Hello everyone, uh, my name is Richard, Candidate Master, and I'm back to cover the second round of the 1962 Intersonal Chess Tournament in Stockholm. In round two, Fischer has white against a legend in chess, uh, Paul Benke. He was eight-time US champion and he also is credited with a couple of uh, opening that uh, for example one g3 is called the Benko opening uh, he used this opening to beat Fischer and also Michel Tal uh, he also is famous for the Benko gambit of course so in this game Fischer is white and uh, Fischer plays one e4 uh, black plays c5, uh, the Sicilian, the most popular response to 1e4. Uh, white plays knight to f3, and black continues knight c6. Uh, white chooses the open Sicilian, this is the main line, where white gets fast development and also attacking chances, while black gets an extra pawn in the center, and he also gets the half-open c-file, which he relies on to give him uh, some counterplay. Um, black takes on d4, knight takes d4, and queen b6. This move I have <coughs> encountered at some occasion, but it's quite rare, it doesn't happen that often. And when I researched this game, I found out that it actually had a name which surprised me. And this is the Grievous Sicilian. It's named after a Greek grandmaster and he has around 80 tournament games in this line. So he's been quite, uh, he's played it quite a lot with good results. And uh, the move scores surprisingly well. And the reason is that uh, the players using this line as black is highly specialized. It's not that the queen b6 is such a strong move, but they are quite, uh, they know all the details, all the small details, how to play the position, basically the tactics and so on. Um, uh, white responds with queen b, uh, knight b3. And this is the point of the Grievous Sicilian, that the black immediately puts pressure on white's centralized knight, forcing him to a less active square. Um, if Instead of uh, knight b3, if white would play c3 to um, secure his knight in the center, then you have some drawbacks because uh, the knight on b1 cannot develop easily to c3. Um, so white plays knight b3, and black attacks the center pawn with knight f6. Uh, white defends this pawn with knight c3, so quite natural moves. And black continues with e6 to develop his uh, dark squared bishop. And Fischer chooses to play bishop e2. Uh, my first reaction is that I would also consider bishop d3 as an option, where the bishop is perhaps a little bit more actively placed and you can later use this bishop in a kingside attack once you get to play e4, e5. Uh, another good move except uh, for a bishop e2 is to play a3. And the idea of a3, it's not a developing move, but it definitely restricts the dark squared uh, bishop for black because the most active square for the dark squared bishop in this position is to go to b4. But if you play a3, it's a little bit prophylactic move and it's a well-invested tempo, I believe, to maybe black needs to play bishop e7 after white uh, plays a3. And that's a much more passive position for the bishop. So that would be interesting. And uh, in the game, Fischer plays bishop to e2 and black plays bishop b4, which is the most natural move, and pins the knight and puts pressure on the e4 pawn. Uh, white continues with the castling short, which is, in a way, it's a pawn sacrifice, but I think it's very dangerous to accept this pawn sacrifice. 
uh, black could take the knight on c3 bishop takes c3 b takes c3 and then knight takes e4 but uh, even though white has the double c pawns then white gets compensation he gets the bishop pair he gets some attacking chances and uh, one line that illustrates this is uh, bishop takes c3 b takes knight takes bishop d3 attacking the knight uh, you could go back with the knight but uh, if you take on on c3 i believe that queen g4 is quite strong attacking the g7 pawn and in the next move uh, white will probably play bishop b2 so if you go back to f6 then uh, bishop a3 is uh, strong keeps control over this important diagonal a3 to f8 and this means that the black king cannot easily castle so he's stuck in the center white has the bishop pair and as soon as the position opens up uh, black is going to experience some problems with the king i think so um, yeah here i have this line queen g4 and uh, if g6 bishop b2 also castle you can play bishop b2 it looks quite strong for white a strong attack uh, in the game uh, white castled but black didn't take this pawn it's much too dangerous uh, black decided to just uh, castle short which is sensible uh, white played queen d3 protecting the knight on c3 and keeping an eye on the e4 pawn as well and black decides to take on c3 he's probably hoping for queen takes c3 and then it would be quite safe for black to take the pawn on e4 because the king is castled and uh, he does white doesn't have the same attacking chances he he wouldn't have uh, the same compensation for the pawn here so white takes back with the pawn this doubles the uh, the white pawns on the c2 c3 squares uh, the double pawns but white has the bishop pair and um, they are quite good in compensating for this kind of weakness so black decided to play d5 in this position usually uh, when you play against the bishop pair uh, as a rule of thumb you should try to keep the position closed however um, if you follow this rule blindly uh, I think it's a bit dangerous because in this position the main problem for black is how to develop the bishop on c8 and uh, it's not so easy you cannot play b6 because the queen is blocking this pawn and also black has pawns on d7 e6 so it's not easy to get this bishop out so he decides that it's more important to solve the problem with the bishop and uh, then to uh, uh, follow this principle about playing against the bishops so black plays d5 and uh, white takes on d5 he tries to open up the game um, and now black decides to make uh, to take with the e pawn it's also a little bit surprising um, you could choose to take with a knight but I think this is better you do get an isolated pawn on d5 but at the same time you solve this problem with the bishop on c8 and uh, white also have some pawn weaknesses on the c-file so e takes d5 interesting choice and now white decides to play bishop f4 it's a good square for the bishop it's actually much better than to play bishop a3 because if you play bishop a3 then black would just respond with rook e8 and the bishop on a3 is uh, just controlling a lot of empty squares so on f4 the bishop is protecting the white king um, black can never get his queen on the diagonal b8 to h2 
for example, and also this bishop on f4 is preventing black from protecting the b7 pawn at some point playing rook b8 is not possible here. So bishop f4 and black plays rook e8, uh, putting the rook on the open file. Uh, white also puts his rook on an open file, he plays rook b1. And this poses black some problems. It's not only that he's uh, pressuring the b7 pawn a little bit, but black also needs to find some safety for his queen, which is now directly opposing the white rook on b1. And uh, let's see, black decides to play knight e5. He attacks white's queen with this move. And uh, Fisher decides to offer a queen trade with queen d4. Uh, black takes on d4. So this is an interesting moment in the game. Uh, white needs to decide how to capture back. So Fisher decides to take with a knight on d4. I was a little bit surprised at first when I saw this game that uh, Fisher didn't play c takes d4 to straighten out his double pawns. However, before the queen trade in this in this position, um, I believe that both sides have a pawn weaknesses here. I mean. Um, White could develop an attack against the isolated pawn on d5. Uh, he has options of doubling the rooks on the d-file. Uh, black also have some targets on the c-file. He can double his rook against the c3 pawn, for example. But uh, if, if uh, white decides to take with a pawn on d4, he can no longer attack the d5 pawn with a doubling the rooks on the d file because this file is closed. Also, he still have the problem with the c2 pawn. It uh, can be quite weak in this position if he takes with the c pawn. And if he would at some point play uh, c4, then black can just take on c4 and white still has the isolated pawn on d4. That uh, that would give black an excellent game to pressure this pawn. So. Knight takes d4 is the correct choice in this position. And uh, so let's see, knight takes d4, uh, black plays b6. This is solving one of the problems in his position. White had some pressure along the b, b file and black couldn't develop the bishop on c8 because then the pawn is unprotected. So b6 solves this problem. Now white plays knight to b5, an interesting choice because um, white is playing against the dark squares a little bit. Uh, black is missing his dark squared bishop, so uh, white can jump to c7 and fork the rooks or he can jump into d6. So it's an uh, interesting active choice to play knight b5. Uh, black plays knight g6. This is a double attack. Uh, the rook attacks the bishop on e2 and the knight attacks the bishop on f4. So there is only one move, I think, to to cover this situation. And uh, white plays bishop to e3. This uh, takes care of bo both the threats. And uh, black plays bishop to a6 pinning this uh, knight on b5 because the e2 bishop is hanging and uh, white plays rook to e1 protecting this uh, bishop on e2 uh, rook play uh, black plays rook to e7 and now white goes bishop to f1 retreating the the bishop and uh, I think that a4 might have been a good alternative here uh, at first because it gives uh, white uh, some more options if black decides to capture the knight on b5. If you play a4 then you can take back with the a pawn 
and later you can double the rooks on the A file. But uh, there is reasons why uh, Fischer decided to play bishop f1 and I think that if you play a4 in the position then black can take on b5, a takes b5 and immediately play rook c8 attacking the c3 pawn. If bishop d4 then he plays rook to e8 and gets very active play. I think this is fine for black and um, this is probably the reasons that Fischer uh, shows to play bishop f1 because it gives black perhaps less counterplay than this line. So bishop f1 was played, um, black decided to play knight e4 and this also has a threat, he threatening to play knight takes b5 and then capture the pawn on c3. So uh, Fischer needs to defend this pawn, he plays bishop to d4 Black plays rook d8 and uh, here if you like you can pause the video and see if you can find the move that Fischer either missed or decided not to play but I think it's a very interesting move that he could have played here. Uh, in the game Fischer decided to play rook bd1 but I think a very interesting alternative is to actually take on a7 in this position instead of rook d1 and uh, it's a tactical move but if black takes back on a7 like this then you can play bishop takes b b6 attacking both rooks both the rook on a7 and the rook on d8 with this bishop so if black for instance plays rook a8 a to a8 here, then a very strong move would be to capture this uh, bishop on a6. Now black cannot play rook takes a6 because the rook on d8 is hanging. So probably probably after bishop takes b6 then uh, black needs to play bishop takes f1. So white takes on d8 and uh, this is a difficult position for black because if he tries to save the bishop on f1 then uh, white can play rook b8 poses some mating threats he also threatens to play bishop to b6 check it's a discovered check and then he captures the rook on a7 so this is a little bit dangerous so in this position if uh, black for instance plays rook rook a8 uh, I'm not sure what happened here let's see let's go back here and see if I get everything correct bishop takes f1 rook takes d8 rook a8 yeah this is the main line and uh, if white plays f3 then knight d6 king takes f1 rook takes d8 and then a4 so I'm not sure if this is winning for white but it should be better um, considering that you have a passed pawn on the a file the two rooks could give some attacking chances uh, you could also target the d5 pawn in the position and this kind of position is not ideal for the black knights because they don't have any good outposts it's not easy to find a uh, good outpost for both your knights perhaps you could use c4 but um, this position should favor white it's probably small advantage for white or perhaps equal is not easy but I think uh, it would be an uh, interesting choice where you could play play for the win actually so Fischer decided to play rook d1 um, after rook d1 rook bd1 uh, black decided to take on b5 uh, bishop takes b5 and rook c7 so um, with rook c7 black uh, attacks the c3 pawn 
because both knight and rook is attacking only the bishop is defending this pawn but here is actually another opportunity so you can pause the video and you can try to find the best continuation for white in this position uh, Fisher didn't find the best move here because he played rook to e3 but a better better choice here is actually to play bishop oh sorry about that bishop to uh, bishop takes b6 would have been quite a good move and the idea behind this move is that the d5 pawn is pinned when you take on b6 and the e4 knight is hanging because the rook on d8 is not defended so it's a little little tactic bishop takes b b6 a takes b6 and rook takes e4 and black should follow up with rook takes c3 and now you just play bishop a4 this position is clearly better for white uh, you have a lot of play i mean the bishop will be perfectly placed on b3 it will protect c2 but also attacking d5 and both the pawns on b6 and d5 is uh, they are targets for white in this position so he has the initiative here and the bishop is better clearly better than black's knight um, in the game fisher decided to play rook to e3 and uh, black continued knight d6 attacking the bishop on b5 uh, white moved back to f1 with the bishop and black continues jumping with the knight he first hits the bishop on b5 and now he hits uh, both the rook on e3 and also the bishop on d4 so he's aiming to exchange this uh, strong bishop on d4 probably um, black uh, white plays uh, rook f3 uh, attacking the knight and uh, forcing uh, black's hand a little bit so uh, black decides to take on d4 rook takes d4 and knight to e5 so uh, the knight on g6 wasn't perfectly placed so uh, he feels that he needs to centralize this knight get it back in the game and the white plays rook to e3 attacking the knight uh, black decides to uh, protect the knight with f6 to keep the knight in the center uh, white decides that he he don't want to have the, this knight in the center so he plays f4 to chase the knight away black plays knight c6 uh, rook goes to d1 uh, black improves the position of the king uh, because this is uh, the queens are exchanged and this position have more of an endgame character so it's important that your king tries to move back to the center um, white plays g3 preparing bishop g2 to attack the d5 pawn probably and knight goes to a5 and uh, white doubles the rook against this uh, d5 pawn um, black ignores the attack on the d5 pawn and the idea is that if white plays rook takes d5 then uh, black plays rook takes d5 white takes with the rook on d5 and then black can play knight e3 attacking the c2 pawn attacking the d5 rook and he can also exchange on f1 so in that position if um, i can actually show this let's look at this line it's maybe easier to follow rook takes rook takes now knight e3 if white for example plays rook d2 to protect the c2 pawn the best thing is probably to take on f1 king takes f1 and rook takes c3 and here black has a good game um, i don't think there's any risk of losing this because probably yeah it's probably quite equal anyway um, let's have a look at the continuation bishop g2 was white's choice 
and uh, Benke played rook to c5 to protect the d5 square but uh, white decides to take here rook takes d5 rook c takes d5 rook takes rook takes bishop takes knight to e3 so the game has simplified and it has become a bishop versus knight endgame uh, white does have an extra pawn but it's not a happy extra pawn the extra pawn is on the queen side and it's um, these terrible pawns the c3 c2 a2 all weak pawns um, if this extra pawn would have been on b2 and you can keep this extra pawn then probably you would have very good winning chances but with this pawn structure, I would say it's quite uh, equal game. Maybe a small advantage for white because of the open character of the position that should favor the bishop in general. But let's see how the game continues after after this knight e3. Um, white plays bishop to e4, protecting the c2 pawn, also attacking the h7 pawn. Black plays f5 attacking the bishop bishop moves back to d3 and black plays g6 securing his f5 pawn and white plays c4 uh, black continues to improve the king by playing king e7 uh, white plays king f2 attacking the black knight knight g4 check uh, check on the king also attacking the h2 pawn so white needs to play king g2 to protect the pawn king d6 uh, white has um, some ideas of placing the king on c5 and continues to improving the king which is important in the end game uh, white plays h3 that's a good good way of protecting the attacked pawn on h2 knight f6 king f3 improving the king and now black plays an important move h5 so uh, otherwise if you don't play this move then white would get to play g4 a little bit too easily but also when you play a move like this you you have to consider the possibility if white managed to get around if uh, the white bishop can infiltrate the black king side uh, that would be very dangerous when you have all the pawns on light squares so this uh, light squared bishop could easily just pick off one by one those pawns so that's dangerous but i think it's a in this position it's a good choice to play h5 um, white plays c3 and uh, black plays king c5 it's a very natural square for the king to keep an eye on those pawns on uh, on the queen side uh, white plays bishop c2 this is a small trick because uh, white wouldn't mind seeing black playing king take c4 then you would play bishop to b3 check and then the bishop would go to f7 and collect a few pawns on the king side um, black plays knight e8 he's not interested in taking this pawn on c4 and uh, activating the light squared bishop so he plays knight e8 and fisher immediately plays g4 important move to open up the king side and improve your bishop on c2 also uh, as soon as he gets the chance to play g4 he, he does that so h takes g4 it's h take g4 and now black is ready to take this c4 pawn so uh, black needs to get some counterplay on the queen side so he decides to take this c4 and c3 pawns and he tries to uh, defend his uh, king side because there there has been some simplifications and probably his knight can handle the king side alone um, white takes on f5, g takes f5, bishop takes f5, knight d6 attacking this bishop, bishop e6 check, 
king takes c3 and black decides to play king g4. Uh, if white would play f5 in this position then uh, it's possible that black can just sacrifice the knight immediately on this pawn and then he will focus all his resources to eliminate the a2 pawn. So f5, knight takes f5, uh, bishop takes f5, king b2 and then you will advance your queenside pawns and try to eliminate this a2 pawn. So instead Fisher plays king g4. He tries to uh, position the king, move around his pawn with the king and try to force the knight away and then try to queen his uh, f pawn basically. So um, uh, Benke plays b5. He uh, tries to um, play as quick as possible on the queen side to eliminate this a2 pawn. Uh, king g5 is a logical uh, attempt by Fisher. Uh, black plays a5, king f6, b4, bishop to b3, knight e4 check, king e7, knight g3. This is important because you want uh, white to use as much time as possible to advance this pawn. You don't want to make it easy for white. So knight g3 prevents f5. Um, white plays king to d6 and now black finds a forcing way to eliminate this f pawn. He plays knight h5, very nice move. f5, knight g7 attacking the pawn again and now f6 you play knight e8 check and actually I think the game was agreed a draw already at this position but I've added a few moves to show why it's quite an easy draw uh, for black here. So uh, the continuation of the game uh, could have been uh, f6, knight e8 check, king e7, knight takes f6, king takes f6 and king b2. And now king e5 trying to get back with the king and a very important move is to play a4 immediately not to waste time with the uh, king a3 or something like that. Just play a4. White cannot take because then he will lose the a2 pawn. If uh, bishop e6 then you play b3 and there is no way that white can preserve his last pawn. So this game is is a draw. Um, Alright, so I think this was quite an interesting game for, for me at least. Um, I found this Grivas variation, Grivas Sicilian. I wouldn't uh, have known otherwise that it, it was an uh, opening complex, that it had, a, had its own name. And there's also some interesting points in the choices that the players made early in the game, uh, where Fisher accepted, accepted to take back with the knight on d4 instead of taking with the pawn because usually we make moves uh, a little bit too fast when we just uh, play by instinct like um, eliminating the double pawns is important because we know that double pawns are bad but in this position Fisher decided to keep the double pawns because that that was the better choice also when black decided to take back with his pawn on d5 that's an important decision because it gives black a uh, isolated pawn but it also makes his game easier because he can get out with the bishop. Also when black plays d5 it's a little bit counterintuitive because you open up the game uh, despite the fact that you're playing against the bishop's pair but uh, the biggest problem at that point was the development of the c8 bishop. So quite a quite a few uh, interesting choices that were made here in this game and um, I think uh, the thing that I've learned from this game is that you shouldn't always trust your instincts but you really need to check uh, what is important in the position and um, yeah 
Thank you very much for watching the game. If you have any comments, you can just add them below and I will try to respond to them. And uh, I hope that the round three of the interzonal tournament, I will be able to upload a little bit faster than this follow-up. Okay, thank you very much and see you next time.